welcome everybody to this episode of the Art Business Podcast. My name's David Bellingham. I'm the Programme Director of the Master's Degree in Art Business at Sotheby's Institute of Art. And my guest this week is uh, David Preston, uh, who is a uh, the CEO, I think, David? <laughs> yeah, Director of, yeah. The, same, direct, same. the Director of Crown Fine Art, based in London. Uh, which is uh, one of the world's best known art logistics companies. So, David, very welcome to this podcast. Thank you for being a guest today. Oh, pleasure. Pleasure being here, actually. It's, um, it's quite nice to catch up too after so many years of um, knowing each other. It is, actually. And I think COVID probably interrupted it a little bit. But um, yeah. yeah, it all started again, a little bit more online than before, but um, it's always best whenever we come, we come together. It's always been face to face, isn't it? And it's, um, yeah. well, hey, the world's changed a lot since COVID. So that's, yeah. that's another podcast, I'm sure. So, Absolutely. <laughs> it, it, seems like, it seems like a long time since I was last down at your headquarters in Stockwell. Um, yeah, and we, yeah. we might be talking more about maybe the, the, the planning of that, 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 that building to make for smooth operations later. I'm pretty sure you had a mullet, actually, David. I'm pretty sure you had a mullet last time you came I, down. Well, I didn't have a mullet. I had blonde <laughs> hair. But that, that's, that's another story. <laughs> um, so um, so anyway, what's your favourite city, David? My favourite city was always New York, actually. Um, I just love the bars, the energy, the fact that um, people always go in somewhere. People go, everyone has something to do. And if you didn't go with it, you're kind of left bit left behind a little bit. But I think as I've grown older um, and probably a little bit more chilled out, um, I spent a lot of time in Italy. And, and my wife, actually, we got married, um, been together a few, few years, obviously, and then got married in the summer. And so it kind of feels like Rome's my second home now. Um, completely different uh, pace. But I think that I've really adopted the kind of Mediterranean family value. Um, some of which is very different in the UK, particularly where I'm from. You know, we felt that family was very close, but it's only when you then go into a Mediterranean family that you realise how close family can be. So um, yeah, so Rome, Rome is a great city, great history as well, obviously. Um, so, so when did you first visit Rome? I think I first went to Rome probably been a number of times, probably thirty years ago. Oh, when um, you were so. When you were younger, yeah, yeah, yeah. But obviously, you start as a tourist, you carry yeah. on, and um, you go. You know, I went to a couple of conferences there, but every yeah. time it's, it felt different. But but then, you know, my my past, and we'll probably talk about that at some point. Was you know, I drive trucks across Europe, and um, I, I, I'd been to Rome a few times in a truck, in a van, um, and uh, again, you always see something different. So, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, I think. <laughs> I think the thing about most European cities of doing driving for a living, as many art handlers do, mm -hmm. um, you can be anywhere sometimes because you only ever see a, a, a warehouse. You go to Paris, you go to Venice, you could go to so many places, but you never get to see the city because you always stand in a hotel which is outside on the motorway. Or um, absolutely, you know, it's it's a problem for a lot of business people, isn't it? That they you, they 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 say oh, I'm off to LA next week, and 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 you say oh you're gonna visit this and that and they say no I don't have any time it's yeah. a real shame. You could be anywhere you could be anywhere yeah yeah, right. yeah. anyway um Rome is a is a favorite city of mine and um talking about driving uh, did you drive in Rome because I remember arriving there with my family a few years ago and we tied a car from Fiumicino airport um and I'd never driven I'd driven in Italy before I'd never driven in Rome and uh we we they 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 said, oh, you, if you want, you can have one of these newfangled tom-toms and make life easier. And we looked at the price. We go, oh, no, I can, I'm OK. We can map read and everything. A big mistake. I, I, when, I, when we got home, there were three letters from Italian police on our doorstep <laughs> in London with fines for going down Senza Unica roads, which is one-way yeah, roads yeah. the wrong way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so what I've learned, and um, I've driven quite a lot in Rome actually, in because when I go the uh, the outlaws, they loan me their Fiat Panda, and yes. it's pretty busted. You know, there's every panel's dented and scratched, so I don't really have to worry too much about it. But it's all about eye contact. I've driven yeah. in Naples as well, which is worse. It's all about eye contact. If you don't look someone in the eye, you can do what you want. So yeah. cut across the lanes. You know, they don't stop at pedestrian crossings because they don't make eye contact. Absolutely. So, that's the tip. So when you're in yeah. London, you get somewhere in a hurry, yes. don't make eye contact. 
<laughs> I, one thing I noticed when I was a pedestrian as a pedestrian in Rome, I don't know if it's changed, is if you try and walk across what what in the UK would be a legal right of way for a pedestrian, like a zebra crossing, um, yeah. which they kind of have in Italy, but they don't have like the lollipops. They just have black and white stripes. Uh, or, or indeed a pedestrian crossing, like a pelican crossing, they get really angry if you if you're on it legally. They yeah. they kind of get very very impatient and kind of. Whereas if you actually if you actually look towards them, just walk across in front, and they seem to kind of quite like that sense of anarchy. Oh, I'm going to respect you because you're walking across the road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't make eye contact. contact. Yeah, exactly. Is, you just have to do yeah. it. Yeah, and if you did yeah. that in if you did that in London, of course, you'd be hooted out of hell. Um, crossing yeah. the road so it's well, really fun. I was I was in Rome last week funny enough I went to Madrid and Rome last week and um I crossed the zebra across the pedestrian crossing there's a car parked on the zebra crossing yes as, as they do yes and as the uh the guy was getting into it I, I gave him the, the hand <laughs> yeah. and he kind of just looked at me got in his car and off he went you know it's, yeah. uh, it's how it is. They, <laughs> they're very good at sort of being really insulting to one another Italians and then forgetting it they're getting it off their chest yeah. whereas the Brits are <laughs> so bad at that you know the road rage thing comes out yeah, and it yeah. turns into yeah. a kind of grief GBH you know <laughs> so I actually just, just one other thing I remember I remember being with a group of students in Rome and I shouldn't have done this but I was talking to them about this that that Italian drivers, um, if, if you just cross in a in an illegal manner, they respect you so long as you kind of look at them and put your hand out and wave and maybe smile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they said, don't believe you. So we're at the Colosseum, OK, just coming out the metro, crossing the road. That's one of the most dangerous yeah, yeah. places in Rome for cars because it's multi-lane going round in a circle mm -hmm. and everybody loves to race around it. And, and I said, look, I'm going I'm to walk across to the Colosseum with my eyes closed. And they said, Go on then, don't, don't believe you. And I did. And they were absolutely amazed. I said, but for God's sake, don't try this at home, kids. You know? <laughs> so yeah. well, you're, you're telling them that story from the hospital bed, wasn't you? <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> oh, dear. Days. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, talking about your your Fiat Panda with the dents in, I mean, you, you just don't care about having a dented car in Italy. And um, unless it's a hire car and you dent it of course that's a different story but I remember I remember coming in on a coach once with a group of students and it, very often you kind of the coach hits the the Colosseum and goes around it to find mm. the hotel and we were going around the, the Colosseum um, obviously in a right to left direction and um, we suddenly the, the driver started swearing and looking down and there was a Fiat Panda actually caught on the edge of the coach like its wheel hub had caught on the something of the coach and they yeah. went round twice before the car yeah. kind of swearing at one another before the car <laughs> fell off <laughs> and then yeah. they just didn't stop for insurance purposes and they just carried on um, their way it's it's anyway anyway yeah. so that's i mean rome <laughs> rome anyone any listeners who've never been to rome it, we're making it sound like a nightmare as you say it's an absolutely beautiful place yeah. that one just wants yeah. to yeah. constantly go back to you never exhaust and um the opposite. Do you have a favourite place where in the countryside or by the sea that you can? Yeah, kill? and it's um, it's probably an emotive one actually because being from South East London, I think I think you find most people in London tend to stay on the same side of the river they're from. So people in you know in Essex will go to let's go to South End, or people from the South West will go to Brighton. Well, people in South East London would generally go to Kent. So it was always the kind of Fanet, um, Herne Bay, Margate, and always remember Margate and the amusements park. You know, it was it was great memories as a family growing up. Um, and been back a number of times since. So, you know, working with the Turner Contemporary there, yeah. one of the um, one of the corporate sponsors. Um, it's a great place and they're doing a lot for the community there. But it's always that past paradise, isn't it? You know, you think back, you go there and you see the amusement arcades that you used to go to when, you know, you're seven, eight, nine years old. What's it called? Dreamland. Dreamland. Dreamland, that's it. That's yeah. right, and it closed there, down. There in the summer again, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and of course Great. the reason the reason all these places closed down because I I I lived I grew up in Gravesend on the other side okay. of the street. Oh yeah, and yeah. but we just went straight down. We didn't have a car, so we just used to get the train. My dad worked for British Railways, so we all got free travel all the time. So at weekends in the summer, we'd just get the train, go down to Broadstairs, Ramsgate, Margate, yeah, yeah. those places, yeah. Whitstable, and it was wonderful. And that was in. Actually, I better do I say the decade that was in the sixties. Then, of course, what happened in the seventies very and was cheap air travel. So people with not that much money would were suddenly able to afford instead of staying in wet 
England, they were able to go for quite cheap package holidays to Lorette de Mar, mm, and, the, yeah. and that's what we did. And everybody else was doing it. So all of those lovely seaside towns, as you know, uh, became abandoned. And it's only recently that they've started doing them up. And what's significant, I think, for our listeners is the way they do them up is usually centred around art. So you've got, as you say, Turner yeah, Margate. Yeah. Yeah, and culture, you've got yeah. the Folkestone Triennial art, art triennial. Mm. And it, it, mm. It's so interesting the way art is used for regeneration in that manner. Yeah. Well, I mean, on that note, just uh, we went down to Kent because we were one of the poor sods who uh, couldn't afford to go on a plane. I think my, my father never went on the plane until he was probably 61. Yes. So, um, you know, so, yeah, it was always... It was always uh, UK holidays for us as a family. Yeah. The car. Well, that, that's strange. Nell was calf. Nell was calf in Gravesend on the way. Oh Just right, the, uh, yes. The yeah. yeah. Do you remember Laughing Waters on the A road as you went past? Do, yeah, do you remember yeah, that? Yeah. The rest of yeah. <laughs> Used to go fishing on the lake there. Uh, hence oh, Laughing right. Waters. Yeah. Um, in the in, in in when I was a kid. Actually, that's changed, doesn't it? Because I we were really we were you know under ten and we had bikes and we at weekends we go up there and play in the woods and fish and yeah, you know yeah. no one worried about us. It's what what a change. I don't think kids <laughs> under ten would do that. <laughs> but, <laughs> anyway, yeah, lovely, lovely. Times. Um, yeah. so. <laughs> Oh, you're reminding me of all those wonderful childhood days. And um, anyway, so do you have a favourite building? I don't say Crown in Stockwell, but you might do. Oh, let's not talk about Crown. <laughs> Who wants to hear about Crown? I mean, yeah, they're a good company, but hey, we're not here to talk about Crown. Well, we'll be um, talking about them later. Yeah, Natural History Museum has always been a favourite. I think I used to Which drive past it so often. Natural History Museum. Oh, yes, yes. In Kensington. Um no, not really. Not really. I think um, no, I think that drawing museum has always been there for me. Yeah. yeah. Which is odd because I'm a much more non-conformist, contemporary, conceptual <laughs> type person. But for me, it was just maybe it was the first museum I went to with a school trip and was always in awe of it. And it just flashed back to me when I was an adult. I, I don't know, but always had a soft spot for that building. Yeah, no, same here. And I, I guess when it was built, I think, the architect was a late Victorian architect, Waterhouse, if I remember, not mm. the painter, another one. And uh, and and those lovely kind of uh, Gothic, Gothic revive the Romanesque revival rather, not Gothic. Yeah. The animals yeah. that obviously are site specific for the actual museum. It's That's a right, but I think it's quite, slightly digressing. I think having worked so long as also at the airport, I think I really like airports. I don't know. Yeah. It's, I'm not going to say aesthetically, but again, if it kind of provokes an emotion. Then I think airports are great. I think airports are great for your well-being. Um, so what's your favourite building? You know, the departure lounge at an airport. <laughs> when the, the flight's on time. Yeah, drinking pints at four in the morning because you're going to, you know, the other side of the world where the time difference <laughs> is. <laughs> but no, I, actually, I mean, obviously airports, uh, I think what you're saying is that they're obviously very atmospheric because a lot of people are, are excited by, you know, in two hours, we're going to be in the heat. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And, and, you know, it's, it's usually, usually, well, I suppose you're going on business. So that's, that's maybe different. Um, but, you know. Oh, I used to work there. You know, I used to work a big part of my that's career. That's right. Yeah, we'll come to that. So, yeah. 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 Yeah, no, I no, I agree. And I um, I remember going around to Stansted Airport um, with some students. We were going to Pompeii, actually, for, we had a great week. We were kind of actually doing a lot of archaeological um observational work there, there which was wonderful for classic students um but i remember i remember we had to leave west london at 4 a.m to get a bucket shop price a bucket shop priced flight from stansted uh, around the m25 and um and it, it's um yes yeah, stansted is richard rogers and it had just recently been mm. built and yes. and at the time richard rogers was really well he still is but you know it was really yeah. exciting and that was a great experience because it had only just opened you know yeah, it was high roof, lots of glass, whereas the traditional airports were prefabricated kind of concrete, Hayward Gallery style, um, concrete jungles Functional. with lots of asbestos, you know. Um, yeah. But it just reminded me then of a story, which um, I, obviously I used to work at all the airports in Europe and the country, and Stans did. We, there was a huge collector who had bought uh, a, lot, a lot of objects in the UK to ship to another country in the in Eastern Europe and sent his own aircraft over. It was an Antonov 14, 24, one of the two. It was, it's one of those big aircraft with two propellers, the back comes down and you, you basically push everything up a ramp 
to get into the back of the aircraft. There's no hydraulics or anything to help you with it. You use a been Indiana Jones plane. That sort of thing. Yeah, where the car falls out the back, that kind of <laughs> thing. So um so the, the aircraft turned up, we had a big Arctic lorry on the on the um on the apron. Out comes the artwork straight into the back. You know, it filled it was a full Arctic and a full aircraft. And then we'd finished, just as we finished, we tied everything off, we jumped off the aircraft very quickly, the door closed, and the crew ran around the back of the aircraft and got back into the aircraft again um, and started the engines. We're thinking, this is all a bit bizarre. And the engines are firing up, and now the Arctic is still behind it, and it's starting to wobble, thinking, what, what's going on? And so the guy driver's got in the Arctic, and for those who don't know, an Arctic's a huge, long, 40-foot, 40, 40 you know, 18-meter truck. We moved it out of the way quickly, and then the engines, and it starts to move. And then all of a sudden, four airport security vehicles come racing around the corner and blocked in the aircraft because they hadn't paid their landing fees. <laughs> so, and they hadn't got permission to take off either. <laughs> and so this, whoever this guy had um, organised to pick up these artworks, they was hoping probably to keep the 20 grand's worth of landing fees and handling fees, all the help they got at the airport and so on, and just get onto the taxi, get onto the runway. Ryanair, you can wait. I'm going now. And if, if they would have gone, you know, into with all that money, extra money in their pocket. Um, I thought you. I thought style. That's amazing. I, I thought you were going to say that it was. Um, it, it, it's because they suddenly realised they had endangered species with the art objects, or <laughs> you know, they no, were... but out, out the window came a stack of money in cash. <gasps> which were given to this. That was their land. They paid in cash and landing fees. Paid in I cash. Mean, Fifteen, twenty years ago now, you know. But yeah. um, yeah, quite quite an experience that one. When you when you could hand over twenty grand or more in cash in an art gallery. No yeah. questions asked. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> and what, David? What about music? Do you do, do you have any kind of particular music that you go for? Yeah, if it, Desert yeah. Island Disc question: What would you take to a Desert Island if you could only take one? <laughs> I love Desert Island Disc. <laughs> I've probably thought about it on, you know, for many years listening to Desert Island Disc, but never really thought I'd be asked that same question. And I asked my son here actually as well, and he he would say something like, um, "I'll take my mobile phone or whatever it would be." But I um. I don't know if I'm allowed to say this anymore, actually, but I actually quite like Michael Jackson. I like R&B generally, and I grew up in Peckham in South London, where, you know, it was a big Caribbean demographic there, and a lot of friends were from, from that region originally. So R&B has got a kind of you know, neo-soul, soul music. My, my father liked soul music and Luther Vandross and all that sort of stuff when we was growing up. So very much a soft spot there. But, um, yeah, well, I quite like Michael Jackson. Um, well, you know, we're allowed to I say mean, that these days, so, you know, but I guess so. No, no, I don't think Michael Jackson has been, I mean, he's not Gary Glitter, and I'm probably not even allowed <laughs> to say Gary Glitter. You know, I don't think he's ever been quite, um, no. you know, you know what I'm saying. It's a it's a matter of degree, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, um, of course. But no, I do like <laughs> Michael Jackson to get the foot tap in. And, uh, oh, I mean, what an amazing dancer and amazing musician. I, I, I remember in the... Uh, I remember in the school discos when he was little with the Jackson Five, you know, and he was singing Rockin' Robin and these lovely slow songs like Got to Be There. I mean, yeah. heartbreaking, wonderful, wonderful musician and singer. Yeah. yeah. It, whatever happened to him later in life. <laughs> yeah. So that, that, that's, that's the sort of music I like, really. Yeah. Ah, I'm, I'm there. Tamla Motown label. Motown label, yeah. Yep. 45 yeah, yeah. B RPMs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and and um um what about art? I, I, well I'd love I thought to know what's art question doing. actually and, and I think um in all honesty I, I think I might be in the minority. I've worked 30 years now in the art market and I'm probably in the minority to say that um I haven't got a huge passion for art in the same way as <laughs> yeah, for the colleagues here, you know, some have got bachelor degrees in fine art history yeah. or are artists themselves. So all the people I know professionally are linked to the art market and have generally got a passion for it but for me um you know growing up we didn't have access to art you yep. know it, same father said to my father at 16 you know can i 10 pounds go to an art gallery now then he would probably would give me a slap <laughs> and told me, why, why are you not going to the cinema to see die hard or you charlton know? athletic oh, come on not charlton <laughs> but, yeah but that, that same sort of thing right so i um 
We never had art in our family. There wasn't that. That was a, that was a middle class, a yeah. middle to upper class um, yeah. um, recreational thing was to go to a museum or a gallery, or you go with the school, be bored yeah. for a, a day, you know. But yeah. no, so for me, I think I've grown to appreciate it, and I kind of know what I like. And I think um, probably go back to that musical point, actually, in that past paradise. That for me, I think if it provokes an emotion in me, generally it's quite you know, that. That's when it feels successful yeah. uh, on that basic principle whether it's something more traditional or contemporary, um, conceptual, I think if it, and you know, you could go back to when you was 18 and you was in your first relationship and the girl you thought you was going to love for the rest of your life told you to, 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 to do one and not come back again. You know, I think, um, <laughs> you know, you think about those times and if, you know, that artwork could resonate in there. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, for, uh, for example, I saw a, a Frida Kahlo exhibition. I'm going to mm-hmm. go, I don't know, 15 years ago, maybe the Tate, it was Tate Modern. And I kind of had to leave halfway through because I, it was the way she was looking at me. <laughs> the way the free free was, I, the way I was looking at me, I, I started to feel physically sick. And I think I, I linked that back to kind of childhood trauma. Uh, so, <laughs> how interesting. It was. But then you could say, you know, that was quite successful to whether that was the intention of the artist. <laughs> No, it might well have, might well have been, might well have been. But I, I, what I love about what you're saying, David, is that you know one of the first things we say to our students, our students who've done art history courses, we say, look, when most people when they go into an auction house, you know, if you see if you see collectors, most of them are wanting something for their home. You know, it, it, yeah. there may be the odd one buying at the high end who actually like Pino who has a big collection or Saatchi or whatever. Most most people want something with pa- that they're passionate about, and so we say you've got to start looking at art from, as though you're a child, and not and mm-hmm. stop all the intellectual stuff. That is very important as well. But but start looking at art the first time round as as though you're still a, you're a child on an emotional level. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think the, the general principle of my collecting is it, one it provokes an emotion, but also you've got to look at it. Yep. You have to look at that artwork every day. Yep. So I could think of nothing worse than owning the Frida Kahlo. <laughs> He's staring down at you all the time. <laughs> exactly. It could, it, uh, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, you're right. You, you, you've got to look at it like a child sometimes. I remember, I remember at the start of COVID, some of our MA contemporary art students, four of them, they started this wonderful podcast because they were missing one another and, you know, doing it all remotely. They've mm. gone back to their own countries. And it was such fun. Um, it was called Chart, which means chat about art. You can still look it up on um, on something like Spotify. There are other platforms. And um, they, 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 their whole mission was to make art accept, you know, easy for people to, to listen to. So they take a topic like what is medieval art history? And it was hilarious in some ways, but they were just trying to make it um, less um, highfalutin than most people would make it, if you like. Mm-hmm. And um, they... Um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, they had one one of the themes one week was about, I can't remember what they called it. It was something like um, um, uh, art with art related to ghost stories. So they were talking like you're talking about Frida Kahlo and they, they, they'd searched the web and they'd found all of these examples of people who bought like portrait paintings and hung them in their kind of country mansion or whatever. And they had to get rid of them because the portrait came to life or, you know, that came out a bit Harry Pottery. So that, that was a really funny episode. So I, I get where you're coming from with that. And I, I've had works on my walls and I, I've got rid of them in the end because, you know, I, I in the end, for whatever reason, I just get either fed up or I just suddenly don't like yeah. it. Well, there's one which um, I've repurposed, and I won't go into the detail of that. It's a, a work by Bruce McLean, which um, I had in a previous relationship mm. and you know, got divorced. And yeah. I can't bear to look at it because it's <laughs> it reminds it, it's you. Too, it reminds you of the, you know of those times. But yeah, um, yeah, it's funny that maybe this is um, you know if you've got a load of ex students who listen to this, it might be um, <laughs> you, you might recall back in the eighties those crying girl portraits. The crying child. Oh yes, yes, you know? yes. And um, yeah. I think you could probably look those up. And I, I don't think many people would probably know about that. Yes, outside the UK, but it was a portrait of a crying girl. Yeah, and no, I do remember. Bad luck, weren't they? And uh, yeah, no, it's interesting. Years. It's interesting what art does, and you know, nothing, nothing, nothing's new. Um, mm. So, so David, thank you very much for all that. And um, 
It was a long intro there, wasn't it? <laughs> it was great. It was great because we talked. We've already talked quite a lot about art. Hmm. Um, so chat about art. So um, can you say something about when you began to get interested in light like, security, working in security? Where did that come from? And then yeah. maybe your experience then and working in presumably airport security before you actually started becoming like an art logistics person. Oh, yeah. Well, where to begin? It's always difficult to talk about yourself, actually. And you probably, <laughs> how many times have you ever talked this long about yourself? Probably never, right? Mm-hmm. My wife probably tells me I talk about myself all the time anyway, but... Um, <laughs> well, now's your chance. <laughs> now's my chance, yeah, yeah. Um, no, so, you know, I, academically, I didn't get great qualifications at school. I left school, didn't get my qualifications. I, I already had a job, you know, in my family. The moment you become 16 and eligible to work, you're going to work. Mm-hmm. So I got a job in a removal company and worked in the warehouse, pushing a broom, doing whatever they asked me to do. And, mm-hmm. um, yeah, they saw potential in me, which which was nice. And I think if I, if I really think back about those attributes I had as a 16-year-old, my dad had three jobs. You know, he used to buy and sell things at car boot sales, buy and sell cars. He used to do security at the company he worked at. He used to make cranes. I mean, he, he was... A bit of a jack of all trades. He would do odd jobs for people, and, and I think um, you know my my mother was a um, school dinner lady and fitted in with the family routine, right? So, but what what I would say about that was that my dad knew how to communicate, how to network, and you know you think about you got someone who's looking for a television to buy, right? And that television, the guy wants to sell it for a hundred pounds he'll know someone who wants to buy a television and he'll sell it for 120. Everyone would be happy because they bought a television and sold a television, he's earned 20 pound out of it. And that's what he used to do. And so he used to, um, I think that that was the value of money was important. In, yeah, in I, the remember the we, we I remember the same. You know, we didn't have any money to, to go and on. You, you, there was no holidays. such thing as credit cards. So no. to get into debt was considered really, really bad form. So you just had to go without. Exactly, it went without, and they saved up, and they bought things, and they looked after us, yeah. and you know, and they, they they did what they had to do to do that. So, yeah. so I, I felt the value of working, and the value of effort, work ethic, and so I couldn't rely on my qualifications, and I wasn't ever going to go into um, further education. So, um, got when really I got a job, and I would say through hard work and diligence, um, you know, I, they saw something in me, and I, you know, I was at a company called Constantine. Was there for four years. They used to have a removal company called Evan Cook in Peckham, and they had an art division. And I started working within their art division. And come the age of eighteen, they asked me if I would go to the airport and help out with a couple of little art handling things there, and go in some vans, and then drive a van, and then make this career from this museum. And, um, and then yeah, before you know it, you know, I'm working on projects and exhibitions which are happening, and I, I, I still remember to this day a few of them. You know, from. 25, 30 years ago, Fabergé exhibition at the v and I remember, you know, picking up Fabergé eggs in, um, and I won't go too much into that because I don't want to breach any kind of confidence, you know, but, you know. Um, I remember, I remember the show, yeah. Yeah, amazing. And, you know, private aircrafts at Luton, which were going straight to St. Petersburg, you know, it was it was a life I'd never experienced or imagined, you know, being the, the boy from South East London where... You know, going up central London was like a big event. Yeah, you know, I remember that. Do you remember, do you remember, do you remember you come out at Charing Cross and there's Lions Corner House that so you go in there for tea and it was really posh? No, no, we used <laughs> to get remember the train that up to, we used to get the tube up to um, Elephant and Castle to Oxford Oh, you Circle came to, in at Ebel- Elephant Castle. Come up Oxford Street. Street. Yeah, 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 go to Oxford yeah. Street and that was it. You know, everyone was yes. on, on top of you. And um, yeah. yeah, so. Yeah, so I got, I got into kind of security by by chance, really. And I think if I was to say, how did you get into it? I think I didn't really have a career path. I just yeah. went with, I'd like to think, good customer service, yeah. having the pride in what I did. And, mm. and I think sometimes I, I look back and maybe I was a little bit too dedicated. I'd, I'd work like a donkey. I'd work and work. And if someone said, we need you to go to Paris, in 10 minutes i'd have been in the van in nine yeah and you know through that i've got life experience and you know and met some do you, amazing do you, recall, do you recall finding it feeling excited by it by what things that were quite exotic compared to like your your background you know go yeah. flying into, you know 
Yeah, it must have been absolutely wonderful. I, I remember, I remember my dad. I think quite early on, realizing that um, I was lucky to get a scholarship into a public school in Rochester, and I think he quite he he recognized that he needed to take me. To, you know, so he took me to Rome, and um, when I was twelve, and 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 I I just look back at that and think how how lovely of him to see that yeah, yeah, that yeah. was something that would help. And you know, to be honest. I'm sitting here now and it's probably him taking me to Rome. And then we went down to Pompeii for a day that led me. I did my PhD in mm. Pompeii. You know, it's it's amazing how how your parents or folks can give you an opportunity. But I, I hope the students, my students are listening to this because I I think what they should get from this is that hard work can get an attitude, you know, good yeah. attitude, a, a work ethic can get you an awful long way. And I know people, I know employers in the art world they get rid of you very quickly if they don't think you've got that work ethic and that good attitude, whoever you are. And the common sense, you know, and just taking yeah. things really practically at times, not over complicating it. And um, I think what, what we do in art handling isn't particularly rocket science. I yeah. don't think, you know, my, my trade isn't... I, I like to think of myself, you introduced me earlier on as a director of, you know, Crown Fine Art, and that is, in some degrees, you know, logistics and art handling and security and shipping, but that's the easy part. Mm -hmm. The harder part is, um, I like to think of myself as helping helping the art market further their interests in the art market, and that could be your interest, David, is to um, you know help students at the beginning of their career or upskill or learn new things to progress progress their life and their progress their education. And my, mine's to help my clients, and, and I'm helping you do that, right? You're in the art yeah, market, and absolutely. But for yeah. me, you know, if it's a collector who's looking to sell an artwork and I so happen to know an art advisor who might be looking for one, then I'm going to help them out with that. Yeah. You know, if there's um you know if if, if a, a small artist, let's say a small artist, an artist who's got an artwork for a thousand pounds they want to ship to Canada, I'm going to help them out with that. And it's yep. not about the shipping part, it's actually understanding why they wanted to do it, how important it is for them. And I think that's what's most enjoyable. And I think Hopefully you relate to this. I think the older you get, the more you want to help, the more you want I to kind of feel like yeah. you give something back because yeah. we are in a market which I think when you first come into it and you you mention about going to Rome when you're 12 and it's it's overwhelming to some degree the the wealth the um, you know the prestige of the of the objects the clients the mm. it's the, I'm not going to say it's the dark arts but it's um it's a, it's a market which I mean, you've seen a lot of books come out recently with tell-all books where people have been talking about their experience in the art market, right? It's a, it's a little bit behind the scenes, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah there's know, some very, that... there's some very good sort of like what I call airport books about about Sotheby's Bond Street. It's history yeah. and you know anecdotal books. They're wonderful, mm. um, but yeah, no, I, I, I think that, but surely that that's good that that you don't you see your primary enjoyment of your your work as assisting the smooth running of that yeah. art world i think it's really great yeah, yeah. maybe that's how i compartmentalize it because i think by virtue i'm i'm someone who likes to innovate and challenge and disrupt mm -hmm. and i think yeah. if i was just um had a different personality preference i would just be looking at processes and yes. improving what what already exists so yes. no, yes. i've spent a lot of time trying to think about what what the future might look like actually and innovate yeah. Do you think? Do you think, looking back, that you could have, um, um, you know, you could have found yourself in a completely different world and job, and still enjoyed that? I think I often thought this actually. I think I'm not wedded to the art market. I think I could easily switch sectors, and yeah. so you could go into, for example, standard logistics, like moving goods around the country, not necessarily art goods, or no, do you I like the I, fact I that it's art? I might be a bit bored by that. I think, yeah. I think I'd have to, I think whatever I did, I'd want to be the best at it. So I always say like, I could be a street sweeper, but give it six months and I'll be running the, the, the street sweeping depot. Interesting. Yeah. And so yeah. I'm quite That's... handy as well. I don't, you know, you see my hands. I've just been doing some painting and decorating and some building work at the weekend. I've got a few mm -hmm. cuts and scratches and... <laughs> Yeah, you know, I'm I'm really handy, so I think I could turn my hand at most things. But what you won't get, you won't get, and you can agree with this: the variety of what we do every day. Yeah, you always, always got something different 
to yeah. encounter in anything we do, in particular yeah, in this I, industry. I would imagine that in art logistics, you know, you the, the art, the, the, each piece of art is unique. That's what makes art different from a lot of other commodities. And uh, I guess the challenge is, can, you know, you can suddenly be challenged by, oh, I've got to move this Damien Hirst animal in formaldehyde. How am I going to do that? What are the laws mm. about formaldehyde? Yeah, if I, you know? yeah. So there's yeah. always a new there's always a new problem that you have to find a solution for. I I would guess. You're right. It, it, there's lots of that, and um, you know, vehicles getting delayed in in Europe <laughs> or even getting a tire blowout on the motorway. You know, they sure. they really set the anxiety off. But that's also what's quite interesting about it. Anything can happen <laughs> at times. And but I think um, I think it's really the clients which which make it. Yeah, really interesting. interesting. It's a people. It's a people. Across. It's a people job. And again, one of the advices I give my students, who are you know most of them are pretty young, and 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 I think, I think they've come through COVID, and so they've lost, I think, a lot of that ability to network, you know, yeah. physically with people, and I, they're struggling with that. But I I think that hopefully they listen to this and realizing that you know you never give up. You you know you just get out there again and. Um, meet people and go into galleries and start talking to people and the art world is not you know there's not an obvious career structure in the art world you know no. that it's different mm. from other worlds so you don't use a lot of these jobs you don't see advertised uh so you know it, it's more about attitude and you know uh, I, I think and and showing that you're you're willing to work and learning on the job in many ways I mean it's I don't think you're unique actually I've spoken to a number of people uh you know, since I've been involved with this art art world, and um, you know, people were people departmental specialists at Sotheby's who said that they started as a porter, yeah, and they yeah. just taught I themselves. Know. They went to night college. They learned art history at Birkbeck or whatever, yeah, and because yeah. because you know, often they would know a lot more about art, the practical side of it, and the valuation ideas of it than someone who'd like gone to the court hall and studied the history of art. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's interesting. We get quite a few you know students who have been on your course for example and we've had a few working for us and mm. um i think that knowledge has really helped them but they've also displayed practical skills and common yeah. sense and i think that's something they've had to work on you're yeah. right yeah um, i mean I'll, cool I'll, I'll, just as a just as a little story david it, well the stories when we have our our degree ceremony often the parents of the students come for that mm. and a very common a very common comment from the parents to me is um, we can't believe what's happened to our daughter. You know, when she's a year ago, all she could talk about was art. And we thought, oh, she's very arty. When is she going to get a job? You know, and they said that she's completely changed. She can we can now talk about business, about finance. And that that is the greatest commendation, I think, and the greatest sense of gratitude to what we do, I think, for students, you know. Yeah, I think um, there's funny, there's a guy here who... Um... He left school at 18, went to grammar school, great grades, didn't want to go into university, couldn't think mm -hmm. of anything worse, in fact. So he's um, he's been brilliant over like, the last two, three years. And um I think um he has got you've got to monetize your talent. You yes. know, and I think whether whether you like it or not, you know, we all have to pay for ourselves. And I think with, you know, you read and you know, listen to the news, read papers, you know, kids on average now are going to stay at home until they're 37 or something, isn't it? And take my son, that, my son is down, is working from home below where I'm speaking now on a yeah, call. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's, it is really tough for that generation. I think we're really fortunate. Yeah. But, um, you know, his talent, he's got a fantastic talent and he's got to learn how to monetize that. Yeah. And I think That's the students, when, when they come into your course, mm. when they leave, I think they've yeah. got better understanding on what their passion Monetize yes. your passion or what you've got yes. a real passion for. Yeah. And you'll find and the thing is that what always amazes me is the the diversity of what careers your students go into, actually. It's yeah. um not always administration. Some start their own businesses, some travel, some I mean it's phenomenal actually. Really, yeah. really good. It's a pleasure of always being part of that for a number of years. Yeah, no, I think that's true. I, that, that, the, the course is is deliberately broad, so we never dive deep into any one thing. Um but employers of our students say that that's what makes them valuable to them because they they can turn to them and say do you think there might be a legal issue here and my students have know enough about law they might need to call then suggest they call a lawyer but they know enough about it to say yeah you know you will need to do pay this tax or there may be an yeah. ethical issue that they understand as well but they could also 
you know, if an employer says, could you sit down and do an index for me in, in an hour for this artist, they can do that as well, you know. Uh, so, so yeah, it's kind of, it, I, we, we like to think it's multi, it's interdisciplinary, but also teaches them lateral thinking. So instead of just mm -hmm. focusing as a lot of academic courses do on one thing, they have to be able to think about, not just about art, but about art from different periods, different places in the world, different materials, how the law mm -hmm. affects those things, all sorts yeah, of things, yeah. you know. Yeah, um, I think um, I just want to plug that my yep. wife is a photographer. She she worked in the art market and she took one of your courses. Actually, she paid a few hundred pounds for it. It was an abstract course, learn about okay. abstract art and that movement. Um, and she found it incredibly beneficial to her career. Actually, so she I felt it was a great investment for her to invest in her own career. Mm. And it was a short course and it's really easy to follow. So. There you go. Plug, plug in your, course, your courses you, at the Institute. Are you able to say what, what she's working on now? What the, what her work is? Uh, well, she's a photographer now. So, because um, you said that she's a photographer. Yeah, she's yeah. yeah, a photographer now, yeah. yeah. So, but when she was working in the art market. How interesting. Um, she, was, she was networking and she felt she wanted to be able to hold her own a little bit more in conversations about, you know, the market she was working in. You know, go yeah. to an exhibition. And um, you mentioned yourself, you know, I mean, she wasn't looking for a job at the time, but... People to people, that's how this market works generally. And I think the impression you can give when you're when you're networking, you, you get to start having conversations about what you can bring. And I think that knowledge really gave them more confidence to have conversations about other things. Exactly. I think it. I think that's it. A lot. You know, we get we get an increasing number of students who are, who are coming from nations where they don't teach art history, and so we have to work out ways that they can do online courses like those. So that they become a, they they understand some of the vocabulary, some of the the, the ways that you talk about art, and and I, I guess that's what your wife got from that. Yeah, yeah, yeah um, definitely. Da David, you you you've already mentioned Constantine. I I believe that presumably, I mean, Constantine is another art logistics company, isn't it? Is that the point yeah, when yeah. you started working with art, or was it? It was, yeah, it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they had a removal business, and they used to yeah. um, be a crossover between the removal and the art business. So I started right. working with the art business, and then. Got to around 2021 and went to join Momart as their kind of first full time airport person. So mm -hmm. worked for them for 15 years. And David, can I just interrupt? Mostly. Could you, because yeah, I'm sure. aware that some of the listeners may not, could you could you explain what Momart is? Yeah, yeah. So Momart is the equivalent of Constantine, Art Hand and Art Logistics Company, yep. who, um, you know, I don't want to go on too much and bore people with the, you know, the, the way the art, the art handling market works, but. Um, you know, generally Constantine was more kind of traditional art. You Interesting. Know, whereas Momo was much more contemporary art, yeah. Yeah. much more commercial yeah. art rather than heritage. And so, That's right, yeah. Yeah, and so they were building up their museum di division. Um, and I, I used to work at the airport for them, looking after shipments with couriers who might have been travelling from the Met or... So, the, so what did that? Airport. What did a typical day in that job entail? Did, was it like meeting someone off a pl an art courier off a plane? Yeah, yeah, it would be. So uh, on the outbound, it'd be two o'clock in the morning, probably wake up, go and pick someone up from home at quarter to three, take them to the museum, load the truck, take them to the airport, go into the cargo terminal, make sure the airline didn't you know, smash the artwork up, which belonged to the nation. Yeah, so you're literally there as a witness for insurance purposes. Yeah, but, yeah. but more so, it was, a, it was probably more an advisor because it was always very peculiar kind of freight we would handle, you know, tall mm. thin upright crates rather than <laughs> square you know shoe boxes so we'll always really probably do it ourselves, and that they'd watch us do it but facility you know allow us to come in and do that and then I, I had a real privilege of after that we used to take the courier the museum employee over to the uh, terminal and wait for the aircraft to go and then we'd go on the tarmac and watch the aircraft being loaded and the cargo going on the aircraft and we do the same in reverse so mm. But I, I could easily sit with a museum courier for anywhere between eight to 15 hours. Because the flight was delayed. Yeah, or because it was such a big shipment, you'd pick them up from home at three in the morning and the flight wouldn't go until 10 at night. Or, you know, and, you know, obviously you wouldn't be in each other's pocket the entire time. But, you know, you, you, you end up talking about things, whether that be marital issues or, you know, <laughs> Italian cathedrals, you know, yes. but 
but also also learning all the time about about art because people it's just the language it's just the the, the the language you're using about the work you're doing privileged so privileged yeah. to meet so many you know keepers at the british museum and yeah. conservators at the tate um register i mean it was it was so wide ranging that i got so much experience from those guys yeah. and you know when someone started talking about you know, Turin, I probably never wanted to go to Turin, but then, you know, you think, actually, it's a really interesting place to go and visit. And, you know, um, yeah, honestly, amazing. So many amazing people. Um, and then that obviously went into art fairs and travelling with art fairs. And mm -hmm. I just so, I keep going back to the word privilege, but I'm so privileged to mm -hmm. have met so many amazing people. And I looked at your list of people on the podcast, actually, who many I know. Yes, um, I'm sure you do. Again, who, who would have thought at 16 when I left school? pushing a broom that I would have traveled, I would have carried the ashes, you know, the cricketing ashes or um, <laughs> to Australia to train. Did you really? Them. Yeah. You really carried the cricketing ashes really as a kind of, ashes. as like as a cultural object. As a cultural object. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, Had England oh, won them that year or was it Australia? Uh, we went to Australia. We as England went to Australia. I think we won it. Or did we lose five nil? I can't remember. <laughs> Probably. So, <laughs> Um, it's pre baseball yeah, yeah. Jimi Hendrix guitar. Stuff really? Like that, you know? Wow. So yeah, all of these, all of these things, all of these things. It's, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah you, it is privilege because you're not just talking about fine art, but you're actually talking about cultural objects which can include popular culture like Jimi Hendrix guitar or the sports objects like the, you know, the cricket ashes. Um, oh, I guess I won't explain yeah. that. The, I won't. It's a long story to explain to the <laughs> listeners who don't don't know anything about cricket what the ashes are. They can look that up using yeah, a search yeah, engine, yeah. I think. But you um you then joined um Crown Fine Art in 2012, like MoMA and Constantine, another another um well, can I say London based start logistics company? Well, more global based actually. Global, yeah. exactly. Constantine yeah, Moma yeah. UK based, whereas Crown were more global based. Yes, uh, exactly. Yeah, I saw, saw it as an opportunity to further my career. Really, the size of yes. Crown at the time in the UK was a tenth of the size of of Momart. So, yes. an opportunity to run a business. Um, never look back. Actually, well, you know, all I say, Momart and Constantine we've got great people working there. We still we still talk to each other now. We meet each other yep. at conferences, and yes. I look to a couple of guys in particular at Constantine as being role models. Actually, when when I was young, I've got a lot to owe them. I owe to them for my career. And so, yeah, they work from competitors now. But as as people, a lot to owe them. And I'm falling inside the hangry now. But we <laughs> professionally, you know, we were obviously always in competition, but personally, you know, there's no animosity and we're we're it's all good. Which is again yes. great about the art market. And the yeah. something you said earlier on about um networking that generally in this market, people remember assholes. <laughs> Our souls don't go very far. You're gonna to have to beep that out, probably. I don't know if you're gonna to have to put the e <laughs> right. on there. Now. If I say assholes, you know, it's different. <laughs> but, um, people remember those, and I think you can easily burn your bridges. Mm. Such an no, absolute, no, that's it's a very small world, and if you if you if you put someone's back up or behave in an unethical manner, you're it, it can damage you for the rest of time. So I say to my students, you know, don't we had an exam today? Don't cheat in the exam. Because you're just it just become a habit and through life and then one day you're gonna get your comeuppance, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, it's a bit interesting. And and um, when you joined in 2012, Crown Art um, was it in in the building that I visited in Stockwell? Was it has it always been there? No, it was in a, it was a really rundown warehouse in on the Old Kent Road, which is a wow. south of London, and um, yes. It wasn't really, I don't think what happened, Crown had bought a business which really couldn't invest any more money in it because it was owner-based. They really needed to spend money to get to the next level and they couldn't afford to do it. And so Crown purchased that business and it was always the plan to um, move out of there and you know be become a little bit more um, you know challenging the competition. So, but for me, I knew there was gonna be, um, those guys are good at what they do. Our competitors are good at what they do, generally, you know. And so I wouldn't, it, it's not about necessarily saying they're not, it's about doing something different. And I think what I brought to Crown, and I think why we've been so successful, actually, and we've, we've grown exponentially over the last 10 years or so, particularly since we got this facility, which was 
you know, it's about as central as you're going to get in, in London now. It's just two miles from central London from Mayfair. So mm. um, I knew we had to do something different. And so our, our way of doing things is just very different. We're just a real can-do bunch of people. I think I tried to put my own stamp on it because if you was to ring me, David, at 11 o'clock at night and say, I need this by 7 o'clock in the morning, mm-hmm. he was genuine about it, then I'll get it to you by 7 o'clock in the morning. Wow. Because I'm here to help you further your interest in the art market. But obviously, if, if you kept asking me at seven o'clock, then we've got a bit of an issue because you maybe you're taking liberties now. But generally, you know, we're here to, and that's what we've got. We've got a bunch of people here who do that and are motivated to do it. You know, get paid for doing it, of course. But I think you've got to want to do it, not just yep. do it. And yep. so you know, I've built a great team with people who used to work at competitors and got great knowledge now and, it's a great, I like it. I think it's a great place to work. I, I know that a lot of listeners, I mean, we, unless they, we do an elect, we were doing a master's in logistics, but it was, unfortunately, it was, it, we realised it was too niche. So we've gone back to doing yeah. it as an elective. Um, but um, they, um, I, I know that, I know that most of them will have never been to like a logistics lo- location like yours with a where obviously there's always a warehouse because you need place to store these physical artworks before yeah, yeah. you move them and when you know um and of course Sotheby's and Christie's both have quite well known warehouses in and around London Sotheby's down at Greenford and um mm-hmm. uh you know and 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 um, whenever I do take students like to Greenford their eyes open because they're just used to looking at works of art in an art gallery or a white cube space and suddenly they see like a Damien Hirst spin painting just leaning you know in a dusty corner of this huge warehouse and it becomes completely different and when I remember I remember visiting your your location for the first time and I was impressed by that anyway but it it wasn't can you maybe you can say something to listeners about about the architectural layout of it because it's not just a warehouse maybe you could say something else about the yeah, other yeah. functions of your building yeah yeah i think um as i mentioned it needs to be a little bit different from our competitors and i think we've we've got a lot of savvy people in the art market and i think when our clients we're so centrally placed where our clients want to see generally come in because they want to either view artwork or um you know they've, they've got some activity they want to do at our warehouse it should be in keeping with what they know, right? They don't want to come to a dusty warehouse and, you know, truck oil all over the place in the yard. You know, they want to come somewhere where it's in keeping with the art market. So, yeah, we've got exhibitions we put on. We've got artwork available to buy, which is created from the staff. Um, yeah, it's just set out in a way which, you know, for example, our viewing rooms, you don't go from a, a warehouse to go to our viewing rooms. It's completely confidential. Our clients can meet their clients and, look after them we will not be around the place you know it's an extension to their whether you say the gallery or their if they're an advisor their business you know it just creates an environment where they can be comfortable in furthering their interest in the art market mm. and um, we've got a nice bunch of people and i think mm. I'm, I'm what i'm really proud of is the team we've got as i mentioned they're not assholes and i've got no issue if the, the apprentice in the warehouse meets with an art advisor i encourage them to mm-hmm. say hello as they pass yeah. don't hide yeah. anyone away because that person's got um what they bring to our business is as much as sometimes i bring yes you know, we're, all, we're all in the links that can't be anything about the guy who's sitting you know he's 18 and the apprentice or or, or my yeah. top you know sales or move person you know it's it's just it's a great play i mean it's, it's unique um it's not the biggest but it's, it's just really nice i'll try not to over egg it because it feels like i'm doing a sales pitch but um, well, no, I, I, what surprised me, yeah, what surprised me when I walked in is a, how friendly you and everyone else was, whoever they were, you know, sometimes you go into a, you take a car into a garage and the ones that you go back to are where they're, they're really not, they're, they're nice to you as well. They treat you with yeah, respect. Yeah, yeah. Some people just don't, aren't very respectful. And I noticed everybody was nice. Um, I also, I was surprised coming down that, you know, through Stockwell, to suddenly walk and going into this what felt like an industrial estate and seeing your warehouse and seeing your trucks and then walking into this beautiful sort of like uh, office space you know with 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 mm. coffee machines and a reception desk and works of art on the walls it's it, that's what surprised me and yeah, yeah. You know, and then, yeah, and then you took us, in, um, yeah 
You're right. It's a bit of a change in mood, isn't it, from outside yeah. when you're walking in? And, I, that's um... what surprised me, and I think it surprised the students as well. And I also remember the first time I came down to, um, I think I brought my son Inigo there because he was yeah, he was yeah. really interested in. He he worked for a year in Greenford, South of his Greenford. All oh, right. And he had great experience there, considering he was the educated one. He <laughs> he felt no sense of anyone sort of taking the mickey out of him. What was quite funny is that if they had some posh client that was being problematic, they'd say, Inigo, come and talk to this person. <laughs> He'd sort them out. It was so funny. And he had all these amazing stories. And I, I'm not kidding you, David. At the end of that year of work, he'd never studied art history. But I can tell you, he probably knew a lot more about a lot yeah. more art and cultural objects than any of my art history students who yeah. come with their degrees. You know, that was yeah. that was amazing. And I remember you really kindly told him he was quite small at the time, I think. And you said, would you like a ride in our one of our air ride trucks? So and that was fun. He loved that. But maybe you could tell the listeners about about your truck. I, I think most people would they, they see a truck outside Sotheby's or Christie's with art coming out of it. And they, it just yeah. looks like a normal removal lorry. But can you say how it differs very often from a normal? Yeah, lorry? yeah. I think uh, if you think about the biggest trucks, they a removal lorry would probably cost you a hundred thousand, whereas a fine art truck would cost one hundred and fifty thousand to buy. And they've got air ride suspension, so the suspension sitting on air, so it takes every single bump very gently and climate control in the back to keep the temperature and humidity to a level which you know, museums require particularly. Um, towel lift, security tracking, deadlocks, um, panic alarms. You know, it's it's an, and ratchet rails and particular areas where you tie particular types of artwork off to. So very specialised and very considered when they're being built, not off the shelf, so. And is there, is there a problem. custom company that builds them yeah, there's a few there's a few yeah. but it does become a problem when you know vehicles off the road unexpectedly you can't just go to a hire company and go and buy you know, go and rent a truck for a week so yeah. that does cause a, bit of a problem but yeah it's um yeah very specialized there's a lot of the equipment we use is specialized as well but i think mean, just probably wanted to go back to the the thing you were saying about um when you when you came into the facility and i think i always when, whenever we do the education uh, lectures i always say that it's, it's a little bit like dating in your 40s, the art market. Yes. And that's, um, and that's that you, you've you got a particular... You're going to have to work with me on this one because I've probably not <laughs> used that as an analogy before. But if you think you've got 100 people, 100,000 people, right, who have got the capability of buying artwork to the value that would be interested in using my service, yeah? So then out of that 100,000, maybe... Only 10% of them are looking to use someone else because 90% of them are using, are married. Therefore, they use another company and they're happy with the other company. So now I've only got 10,000. Mm. Out of that 10,000, um, half of them want to do it themselves. Mm -hmm. So now I've only got 5,000. And out of that 5,000, half of those, um, they've got their hired help to do it, the man in the van. Mm -hmm. And then you're down to 2,500. And so all of a sudden, if you think about how many people in your area you're looking to date who you're attracted to, then you haven't got, you haven't got much of an option, really, have you? By the time you yep. boil it down. So, and it goes to the same with the clients in the art market because that was a terrible analogy, but I do no, think, I think it's, I think it's a very spot, good one. But, yep. but the reality is when you look at how many clients, and that's why they're clients, because if there's only potentially two and a half thousand potential clients you've got access to, Mm -hmm. then every client has to feel special because yes. that's one less, right, you're going to get. And potentially that one knows someone else who knows someone else. And that yes. one who might have got a bad service is going to tell another 10% of those people. And all of a sudden you've got a, a, a smaller client base. So yes. when you do get a client, you really have to look after them. It's very similar to the auction houses because if the, yeah. if, you, if Sotheby's don't treat their clients with the respect that they they might expect, and, you know, we all know that some art collectors aren't very respectful as well. So it's a, it's a skill to be able to do that in a tactful way. They're just going to go down to Christie's instead. So it's similar, I think, with you, that you've got to, yeah. you've got to keep these people and they will then tell other, you know, it spreads. It's, the, it's that business model, isn't it? Um, it is. You, you were talking about um, climate control in the truck, and I, I, I assume that they're probably quite comfortable to do long drives across Europe in, but that... The, the, the word climate makes me think I, what I was going to ask you, David, is um, 
have has the pressure of sustainability been like irritating to you in art logistics or 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 is it is it helped you to rethink and and, and reposition the art logistics industry and I'm, I'm not just thinking about you know trucks on roads burning fuel mm -hmm. um but also the packaging that you use for transporting yeah, art yeah, yeah. talk yeah. a little bit about that it's funny you use the word irritating to the art logistics i think some people do see it as an irritant i think the irritating thing is not knowing where to begin mm. Um, and we're fortunate enough in Crown that we've got four people who across, so there's, Crown's part of a bigger group in the UK of 500 people and four businesses. So we've got four people who just look after sustainability and, mm -hmm. you know, we come up with ideas, they test them to make sure they are sustainable um, and not a um, greenwash. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we've got a lot of accreditations at Crown, like Ecovardis, we've just received a, a B grade in another one and, um, you know, I think we're really advanced in that, but we we did a lot of um, carbon literacy training here. Everyone's had carbon literacy training, and it's an a online mandatory course in our own university mm. that you have to understand your own impact. And I think we, we will probably acknowledge that there is an issue, and our clients acknowledge there's an issue, and it's becoming... I mean, National Museum level, now, when you picture a, a job... Um, they put out a tender request, 10% of the score in there is now sustainability related. So, you know, whereas before it might have been 50-50 price quality, but now it's 40% quality, 50% price and 10% sustainability. So um, you really have to demonstrate and you have to walk the walk and make sure it, what you're doing isn't just, you know, it's going to go and plant a tree. Yeah, you know, you're actively, you know, we've got our sustainability goals. Um, we've gone for the, um, we picked out four of the UN goals mm -hmm. and the, I think you know, we've, we've got an electric, full fine art electric vehicle coming next mm -hmm. month. We've got, we've just opened an online shop, which is going to be launched in two weeks, um, which repurposes things from the art market. So you'll see more about that in due course. Um, but we also carbon reporting, um, talking to our packaging, for example, we've just innovated a fully paper based sustainable packet packaging. Um, for international shipping, whereas before there was use of polystyrene, which isn't easily recycled by the person receiving it. So there's loads of things you can do. And is it irritant? I, I don't think we've got any choice in the matter, really. <laughs> and, um, you know, yeah, you can, you know, trucks are a lot less emissions now, and that's always in your thinking when you're, when you're buying another vehicle. And there's always a gap between cost and practicality of electric vehicles yeah. at the moment. But... Um, I think that if you put your head in the sand, you're just going to get you're going to get buried because if you think this is going away, it's not. And I think Absolutely. we've got an obligation to our children. I mean, we can talk all day long about business. And, <laughs> Why do you, you want know? to bring a child into the world? Yeah. <laughs> well, you just said, you know, just um, with your grandkids, what's going to, what's life going to be like for those guys? Absolutely. And well, the, it's on the news again. AI, I wonder what life's going to be like. You know, but... it's on the news again this morning, wasn't it? Now, now I think Keir Starmer's pulling out of the promises he was making about green. So we're getting no political parties. Well, none of the two major ones in this country are, seem to be behind it anymore. And yet, look at the weather. Look at what's happening with the weather. You've got to do. It's just going to be too. Late. Anyway, we won't go down that path. Yeah, yeah. Talking yeah. about That's talking about path. irritants that you can't. Do right <clears> now. <throat> I was just going to ask you how you've coped with Brexit. Because obviously what we hear in the news is people like you that are moving, in your case, art across national borders, particularly into the EU and back from the EU into the UK. Has that caught, what kind of problems has that caused and what were your solutions? Well, I think we're quite ahead of the game, actually. So we can clear customs at our warehouse. Um, so we, we drive through borders and don't clear up borders. There's been some delays from people who have not been prepared for it. But I think generally the... Um, I'm going to say the higher end art market are pretty well versed in it, understanding what you can and can't do. There's a group called ISFAT as well, who's a, um, a group of agents like us across the world, um, and we've been sharing information. That's one of the strengths of the group and the affiliation was that everyone in, in member countries would talk to each other and work out how it's going to work. So I think generally it's been all right. I think for me, the impact's generally been on, um, on the lower value end of the, of the market. Um, and I think Where there isn't such value. a good profit margin, I guess. And yeah, and yeah, because you've got to pay for the service ultimately, yes. right? But if you're, there's a there's a crossover value where it becomes less, it becomes more, it becomes cheaper to buy across borders, 
but that's not for a few thousand pounds. So, mm. you know, so at the, the lower end, you tend to find that there might be a bit more of a struggle. Mm -hmm. And if you yeah. could, if you could get the ear of like, say the Minister of Culture, I guess it would be, what what would you ask them to do that would be most useful for you and the <laughs> art market in the UK? The art market in the UK? Yeah, what would be the best yeah. thing that the government could do to make life easier for art logistics? Um, if anything. <laughs> I, don't, I, I think you put me on the spot there a little bit. I don't think there was anything <laughs> I probably got the... Um, the intellectual well, you know, the, you hear some people yeah. say, you hear some people saying, "Oh, you know, like you 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 will hear like temporary art dealers saying, stop resell royalty rights." Although that doesn't seem to be a big issue yeah. at the moment, you know, you might hear them saying, "You know, make it zero VAT when you're moving art around." I mean, would that? Would yeah, that I, I, I think it would help us pick up. Um, I think if we look at the art market overall, I think some of these sticking points are, for example, export licenses to get. Yeah cultural licenses is still a paper-based application process. Yeah. Surely there must be a database. I think they're trialing one now, actually, but a database where you can apply online for an export license, it gets approved online, you get an instant copy, and it, it then goes back into the export licensing system. So, yeah. but, you know, you go back across Europe and import um, uh, um, declarations have to be made in, in certain provinces, particularly in Germany, for example, you have to register an artwork in the region you're importing it into, which wasn't around before. So in France, they've changed the um, the law on exports where if it was a private person, if it's over a low value, I'm gonna say, I think it's six or 8,000 euros, then you have to pay export tax on it. Yep. Whereas that wasn't the case before. So I think um, I, it's a complex web, isn't it? Absolutely. I was gonna ask you, um, you know, I, my question was, what types of art produce the most problems as regarding moving them around? Um, and maybe what's the most difficult material you have to deal with? Can you can you think of some examples of problematic? Yeah, I think um, Eve Klein's always interesting with the pigments. Yes. Um, because uh, of the blue? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I would say that um, I mean, museum objects are always can be challenging sometimes you know because well it's owned by the it's owned by the nation right if yeah. got one chance it, commercial you know if, if you look at two two of the same object in the commercial market mm. they send a, an addison lee motorbike sometimes <laughs> gone pick it up you know whereas in the museum world it's a specialized truck like so with the yes. air ride climate control yes. specialist rates and i think um I think some of the most challenging tend tend to be just generally museum objects. And, yeah, because I and guess museum. they that they have like a lot more like aspirational regulations, don't they, for that for the objects that they're dealing with? Yeah, and 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 also that am I right in saying there's a lot of state indemnity, which so so you know they're not they haven't got the normal insurance company, and that might That's affect right. yeah, the way right. you have to. It's underwritten by a government generally in most exactly. of these because exactly. you, you couldn't afford to commercially insure it. But yeah. I think when you when you go into the the the, the, the real collection care level of a museum, yeah. it's so specialized. You know, they have conservators trained, yeah, qualified to handle and understand every single intricacy of that object. Absolutely. And so, yeah. and so when, when you are handling something like the ashes. Yes. And you know, your, your listeners will have to look up, look that up, and the fragility of that, and the the, um, the off gassing or the the grease on, you know, all of those little shocks and changes which can affect that. That goes beyond the understanding. You can have a broad knowledge, but it goes beyond the real understanding of an art handling company or somebody who works within it. And it's that specialism which makes it really difficult. So, I suppose just general fragility as well is, a, is an general issue. General fragility, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess you're yeah. used to, in, in the art world, in art logistics, you're going to be used to that sort of thing, perhaps more than other companies. But I, I, I've just thought of a really, I don't know whether you want to answer this question or not, but I've, I've been, I've had to, I've been asked my opinion about should the Parthenon marbles, I, it's, it, they're wrongly named that in my opinion, because it's more than just the path. And I've said this on national radio. I've been asked about the current debates about should they return to Athens? If you, if they decide to move them to Athens and they come to crown and say, you've got to move the, say the Parthenon freeze to Athens, how would you do that? Would it be a problem? 
but how do I do it logistically? Or yeah, yeah. how, how do I morally do it? Huge. Well, no, no. How would you? <laughs> You know, huge pieces of marble, and I mean, how would you wrap them, and how would you, you know? Yeah. Um, well, I think there would be. Um, <laughs> we've had objects not dissimilar to that before, actually, in the, in the okay. past few years. So, um, yeah, I mean, everything's possible. Um, yeah. There it's are specialised companies who 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 are better than us at doing that kind of thing as well. Everyone, as I mentioned earlier, on, everyone's got their little niche in the art market, mm. and I would say, would moving those be our specialism? Mm-hmm. No, there is a company who are specialised in doing that. Mm-hmm. Again, you're, you're like not going to someone else. <laughs> no, not say it, but it sounds like I'm promoting someone else. But um, the level would it would it go got, would it have to go in a truck or by sea or by air? Which would be the preferable? Uh, I think to to Greece, it would probably go by road. Yeah, and it would be under escort the entire journey, with multiple stops on the way in secure yeah. premises, um, security, lots of coverage. I, mm-hmm. I don't think anyone would insure it going by sea absolutely yeah and and david finally could you maybe just tell us about a day in your life working in in crown in art logistics maybe you know what happens yesterday or well yesterday was, <laughs> no yes yeah well you know could, just, what happens from the moment what time do you have to get up and get into work and what then what happens? time do we have? well you might you might notice from the last time you saw me that i've got bigger bags under my eyes now so i've, <laughs> I've got a nine month old and a three-year-old and, and I wake up so many times at night at the moment that I don't even know if I wake up at 11 o'clock, 1 o'clock or 5 o'clock. You're walking just, there, just wake up. <laughs> and so um, the day, a typical day yesterday was, oh, okay, it was quite a good day yesterday. Went over to one of our other branches. We had a, an induction for new starters across the whole of the group. And I talk about fine art and say what we do. Mm-hmm. And that's quite rewarding. And then it was month end. So I did the whole of the finance month end, took, took a look at the P&L, looking at... Um, a number of financial things that we have to look at every month. And then I had a meeting about sustainability, then a couple of client phone calls. Um, I didn't see a piece of artwork yesterday. And, <laughs> and I think that's that's the variation to the job because today um, I'm at the Art Central, um, spoken to quite a few of our technicians this morning whilst I was loading trucks. Um, had a meeting with marketing today. I just every day is different, and I think I'm fortunate in that I've, you know my career has got me to the point where every day can be different, mm, um, rather than just doing like a repetitive packing or yeah. Sweeping. But I've done the repetitive, and you've got yeah, to do the you deserve it. Get, yeah, you got to do the bread and butter to get the cream. Another thing I say to my students that even though you've got a degree and now you've got a master's degree with the Sotheby's brand name, don't expect necessarily to go in at the top level into a job. You might have to work work in front of gallery maybe even for two years i've had very good students who've had to do that and i've said just be patient they're yeah. they're after your, they're looking at your attitude and, and 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 all of those people have then been moved you've and, got you to know. earn the right you've got to you've earn the right got to earn the right exactly so david thank you on behalf of the listeners i think that's been right. brilliant and fascinating and i i know this subject a lot of listeners who are interested in art just won't know about and um, I hope they all have an opportunity to visit somewhere like your premises at some time. And they, they might be surprised at, at the way art appears in those premises, but also in the in the professional way in which you handle yeah. these things. And um, yeah. so thank you very much. And, uh, you know, hope you can be a guest again, maybe. Yeah, maybe. And I think that the, the door's always open. Um, we, you and I, we both enjoy talking to people. So, you know, welcome any contact from your listeners if they've got any interest in, you know, interest in the art market. And... Yeah. Getting to make well, our, our life interesting. Right? Yeah, and in in the literature that accompanies the podcast, we'll, we'll put some links in so that they oh, can contact you if they're interested. So thank you, David. No worries. I'll see you around. Take care.